Uh, welcome back to CS162. So um, today we are going to finish up the discussion that we were having of the readers writers problem last time. Um, and uh, I have a little bit of a simulation through the code so we can kind of see how things proceed. So if you remember last time, uh, we covered a lot actually. Um, we talked about, among other things, the whole idea of uh, atomic instructions or read, modify, write instructions. Um, the primary one being test and set, which everybody uh, knows about typically. And, um, uh, but we also talked about swap, compare and swap, and load link store conditional. Um, the key thing to interpret with these was that what everything that's in between the braces here happens all at once in one cycle atomically in a way that cannot be interrupted by any other thread. And so when one thread executes a test and set, all three of these things have to happen. And just to give you the, um, the way to interpret this, what we said is you give it an address, and then you simultaneously grab the value that was there and store a one. Grab the value that was there and store a one, and you do that atomically. And uh, that's enough to basically build all sorts of uh, interesting synchronization primitives. And we uh, talked a lot about that uh, in terms of how to make locks, for instance. Swap is, is similar, but that's where you grab a value and store something else. And so you grab a value, store something else atomically. Compare and swap basically says you take what's in memory, and if it matches one thing, then you store something else there. Okay? And swap and compare and swap are available on uh, architectures such as the x86. And um, there's a version of compare and swap that actually returns the old value rather than uh, success or failure. And uh, so these get uh, the ability to do something very interesting, okay? Complicated. All right. So, but for instance, tested set is powerful enough to uh, build any sort of lock primitives you might want. And so this was one that we looked at uh, where, for instance, we had a guard value and the lock itself was in shared memory. And so um, unlike trying to disable or enable interrupts, we actually can build locks that work across a whole core with multiple, or across a whole uh, processor with multiple cores, or across a multiprocessor with many chips and many cores in each chip. Uh, and the reason for that is that things like guard and mylar, uh, mylock are actually in physical memory and, uh, and shared memory, okay? And uh, notice that uh, guard is actually shared across all of the implementations of locks, whereas mylock, uh, you can have many different versions of this blue lock and they're all different locks. And we gave an interface of acquire and release where you give the address of my lock. Acquire basically used test and set in the spin loop here until uh, it found that the guard was zero. And remember, because test and set is atomic, we grab the value of the guard, store one there. And uh, what we showed was if we built a lock this way where we uh, had a um, well, kind of a, this red thing's like a lock over the lock implementation, then we could very quickly grab the, the guard lock, check and see whether the blue lock was uh, busy or not. If it isn't busy, we set it to busy and return from acquire. So that means that the thread actually acquired the lock. If it is busy, then we put the thread on a wait queue and go to sleep. And then release is kind of the opposite of that, where we sort of wait to grab the guard. Um, if anybody's on the, on the wait queue, we just go ahead and uh, give it to them. Uh, wake them up basically otherwise we uh, free the lock and we release the guard all right and the reason this is not busy waiting is because what's happening here in red is very quick because these the critical section of the lock implementation is fast all right were there any questions on that very quickly so you need the address of the guard and uh so yeah i guess technically this is test and set amp regard or right that's a that's a good catch on there i guess uh anybody else Okay, good. And the, um, in the if case, uh, you're talking about on release. The reason we're not freeing the lock in the if case on release is because we're, we're giving it in some sense over to the thread that we just woke up. And so the lock itself always stays locked in that instance. All right, hopefully that helps. Okay, so then the next thing we talk, so what's interesting about this is this is kind of a skeleton implementation because we really didn't tell you how to deal with this putting something to sleep, okay? What happens if the thread is suspended? Well, uh, the guard is equal to one. Well, that's exactly what you see over here in acquire, right? Because guard is one, 
uh, we put the thread to sleep and we have to set guard equal to zero somehow atomically. So that was some sort of dive into the kernel set guard equal to zero. I didn't really specify how that was, but the idea is it's, it's very similar to what we did with uh, interrupt disable where we put something to sleep and the interrupt got re-enabled when the next one started. Okay. Uh, so um, you need to always analyze a situation to decide whether busy waiting is uh, going to be an issue or not. This we would call uh, not busy waiting because it's extremely fast. You're not waiting for a long time. You're just waiting for the, the previous thread to finish its implementation of acquire or release. Okay. Now, what if the thread gets interrupted while the guard is one? That's very good. Um, that's the one instance where things might take a little longer. Um, we won't worry about that case for now. All right, but that's a very good catch. And that's, uh, that's good thinking there. But for now, let's just assume that we're talking about this being very fast, okay? Now, um, I also told you about Futex. So the problem with this uh, implementation here with test and set was that um, we don't really tell you how to deal with that sleep case because clearly with sleep, you got to go into the kernel. The good thing about this when you don't sleep is uh, you're just using test and set on uh, and uh, sets and freeze on uh, memory, and so you're not actually doing system calls, but when you have to deal with sleeping and waking things up, there is a system call. And so I gave you this good example of an interface that Linux put together called Futex for fast user uh, space mutex. And the idea with Futex was you'd go ahead and, and take a system call into the kernel and it would put you to sleep. Okay, and this is enough of a primitive to build things like what we just talked about with the test and set, uh, so that when you decided that you couldn't get the lock, you could do this system call to go to sleep. The tricky part about that is you gotta make sure when you implement something that you tell it both uh, what your lock address is and the value that you expect if things are sleeping, so that if there's a change from the time you decided you need to go into the kernel to sleep to when you called the kernel uh, with Futex, if something changed in there, Futex doesn't put you to sleep. Uh, it actually just wakes you up right, aw uh, right away so you can check it again, okay? So that's what's clever about this implementation, all right? And this is an interface. You can think of this to the kernel sleep functionality. Um, and it's not exposed typically in libc to users. This is what libraries inside of libc might use to make the, uh, the uh, pthread mutexes and pthread semaphores. And here was an example. I'm not going to go over this again. Um, and the sleeping here, um, the question is sleep until um, Futex wake, uh, wake somebody up one thread, okay? Or n threads, you can kind of say how many in the wake up, okay? Where is that? Let's see, do I have, oh, sleep till Futex uh, wake. Yes, you're right, right there, that's a typo. Thanks, good catch. So in this, um, example I gave you, rather than test and set, we actually use compare and swap and swap. And you should work your way through this, but this is a, a pretty clever implementation where the lock has three values. It's either fully unlocked, it's locked, and only one thread has the lock and nobody's sleeping in the kernel, or contested is a situation where somebody might be sleeping in the kernel. And if we do this in a clever enough way, you can make sure that acquire and re release are extremely fast, assuming there's only one person grabbing and releasing the lock and no contention. And it's only when somebody else comes along uh, when the lock is held that then we move into this contested state and potentially put somebody to sleep. And um, you should look on this on your own. I don't wanna go over it again. I talked about it last time, but the key thing here is that the compare and swap and the swap, these first two are the uh, where we grab the lock atomically in a way that will make sure that we don't have more than one person actually holding the lock at a time. Okay, so now back to where we were when we finished up. We were talking about monitors as uh, a good alternative to semaphores. And a monitor is basically a lock and zero or more condition variables. The zero condition variable is not very interesting because it's just a lock. But a uh, monitor is a lock and condition variables for ma uh, managing concurrent access to shared data. And it's uh, a programming paradigm. It's a way of thinking. And condition variables are a very special entities because they're queues of threads waiting for something inside the critical section. Okay, and the key idea here is to allow sleeping in a critical section 
in a way that the person writing the code can forget about it, okay? And we'll, we'll show you, we're gonna go through the reader's writers example in some detail again, so you can, so you can see uh, how a more complex example works. But the idea here is that you always grab the lock before you touch the condition variables. And if it turns out that uh, conditions aren't right, you can go to sleep holding the lock. Okay, and this, this is the only situation where you ever ought to go to sleep holding a lock, okay? And what this is, is the condition variable is a version of what we've been talking about in our implementations before. For instance, going to sleep with, the, uh, with interrupts still disabled, right? Well, that's kind of the way the code works out. It turns out under the covers, of course, we end up waking up somebody else who then turns interrupts on. So it doesn't actually freeze everything up. Uh, we also talked about the test and set example a little bit ago, trying somehow to uh, both put the, uh, put the thread to sleep while setting guard back to zero. This is similar, okay? So condition val uh, variables under the covers take care of the, the right thing with the lock, but from the standpoint of programming, you think of the condition variable as putting you to sleep uh, with the lock. And with semaphores, you can't do that. If you try to use a semaphore and it goes to sleep and you hold the lock, you've just deadlocked your execution, okay? So there's some operations on condition variables which are useful here. So one is wait, uh, where you have to give the lock. You know, why is that? Well, because the condition variable, uh, when you puts you to sleep, has got to somehow make sure the lock can be uh, released. Signal wakes up a waiter, and broadcast wakes up all of the waiters. And the rule is always hold the lock when doing any condition variable operations, okay? Always hold the lock. So the problem we were talking about at the very end of the lecture was the reader's writer's problem. And essentially the reader's writer's problem was one in which there's a database and the database uh, has access rules. And the access rules are that either you can have many readers all looking at the database at once or a single writer, okay, but not both. Okay, and the reason for that is as soon as a writer touches the database, it's going to uh, potentially disturb any consistency of that database until it's entirely done with their write. And so we don't want readers to be anywhere near a writer. And similarly, we don't want two writers going on at the same time because that could screw up the consistency. And so this model is we want to have some way to have a single writer or multiple readers and a, an arbitrary number of threads that might be trying to do each. And we want to control the chaos. And this is a great, I, I like this example because it shows you how powerful monitors are compared to anything else. And I challenge you to think about how to do what we're about to do here with locks or semaphores. It's just a mess, okay? Now, why isn't using a lock on the single database sufficient? Anyone, anybody wanna remind me why I don't wanna just use a single lock? Yep, we want multiple readers. So if we have a single lock, the problem is if we grab a lock before we read, then nobody else can get in there to read. And we already said we want to have more than one reader. Okay, so we're already need something different. Okay, we want many write readers at the same time, only one writer. Okay, so to remind you again, here's the structure of a monitor program using monitors. And remember, this is a MESA scheduled monitor program. Uh, if you go back to uh, lecture last week, we basically also talked about horror monitors, okay? And that's the scheduling. Uh, MESA or horror monitors talks about what happens when you signal and wake somebody up. The MESA is far more uh, common and it's much better on resources for the kernel. And so MESA comes from uh, the MESA operating system from Xerox PARC. Um, the horror monitor uh, example comes from a mathematician, um, but we're gonna do MESA. And in MESA, the typical pattern is the following. You grab the lock and then you go into a loop and you sort of say, well, as long as the conditions aren't right, I'm gonna to go to sleep, which is take my condition variable, go to sleep, okay? And I'll just, whenever I wake up, I check again. That's where the Mesa part comes into play, okay? So um, will you ever be using a horror style uh, Mesa, uh, monitor in 162? Only in, uh, you know, maybe exercises occasionally. We will stick to Mesa. All right, because uh, that's what you're gonna run into with any monitors and condition variables that you uh, have out there, okay? So notice how we're doing this looping construct. That's because of the MESA aspect. So whenever we go to sleep, 
That's because conditions were wrong, but when we wake up, we gotta go check our condition again. But if you notice, between the lock and the unlock, the way to think about this, and the way I want you to think about this, is we, are, we have the lock through this whole loop, even when we're sleeping. I want you to think that way. Even though you're, you're more clever than that, and somewhere under the covers, you know that the lock gets released and reacquired. But when you're thinking about whether your program's correct, you want, I want you to think that um, between when I grab the lock and I unlock, I have the lock. And the reason that's so powerful is that means that I can look at all sorts of uh, conditions. I can look at multiple variables at once to see how they compare with each other. I can do all sorts of stuff. And because I have the lock, nobody can go in there and uh, mess things up while I'm looking at them. Okay, and when I go to sleep, because the conditions aren't right, yes, I'm letting somebody else fix the conditions, but when I wake up, I know once again I have the lock and I can check things again without worrying about somebody getting in there, okay? So now can things change before weight and after weight? Well, uh, if I find the conditions aren't right and I go to sleep with a weight, things better change because if they don't, then I'm never gonna get out of this situation. <laughs> so uh, when I go to sleep, the hope here is that somebody else will come along and change the circumstances. So when I wake up and check the while loop, um, I eventually get out of here, okay? Okay, well, except it's not, you could say it's not equivalent to holding the lock, but you could think of the lock release as being inside weight, but none of the code that you see on the screen here is ever executed without holding a lock, okay? I realize that this is a, a strange sense of fooling yourself, but you gotta think of it that way. So none of the code you see on the screen here runs without the lock held, but inside of weight, the lock gets reduced and uh, released and re-established. Uh, okay, and we're gonna go through this in more detail in the uh, Reader's Writer's example, just to see. Okay, and once I unlock, now I can do all sorts of stuff, okay? I don't hold the monitor anymore. I'm doing something because I've already checked the entry conditions. And then when I'm ready to finish, I do the checkout. And here's a simple checkout where I grab the lock, I single, signal somebody to wake up, and I unlock, okay? And that, in addition to signaling, I might change some parameters of some sort that they might uh, check and decide it's okay. Okay? All right, is everybody willing to go ahead and fool yourself a little bit that nothing between lock and unlock releases the lock, okay? That's the way you need to think while you're programming. Well, you don't have to trick yourself once you get used to this, okay? This is really a, th a way of thinking, okay? I like, I like to think that with monitors, I'm teaching you a, a pattern, a paradigm for programming, okay? And it's a way of focusing your attention exactly as you say on the parts that matter. So let's look at the basic solution. And we rushed a little bit through this at the end, but it was, it was justified because I wanted to make sure you had it to, to um, mull over over the weekend. But we have correctness constraints, which basically say that readers can access the database as long as there aren't any writers, and writers can access the database as long as there are no readers or other writers in the database. And only one thread can manipulate our state information about who's where, okay? And the basic structure looks like this. The reader, excuse me, the reader says, well, wait until there's no writers, access the database, check out. Wake up a waiting writer if there is one. A writer says, wait until there's no readers or writers, access the database, check out, maybe wake up a, rate, a waiting reader or writer if necessary, okay? Now, this particular solution that we're gonna show you has writers as a priority, that's good. Let's hold on to that thought because we can ask ourselves whether we have to do it that way, okay? But that will be what we've got here, okay? Now, this is where things got complicated, but it's not really, okay? So these state variables are four integers and two condition variables. Those four integers keep track of the number of active readers, that's a reader actually talking to the database, the number of waiting readers, those are readers that are just waiting, ready to go, but they can't go for some reason. The number of active writers is the, um, the ones that are actually modifying the database, and we know already what's the maximum that AW could ever be. What's the maximum number of active writers? One, yep, 
The number of waiting writers is the number that are waiting to get in the database, and that doesn't have any limit. And then we have two condition variables be, uh, for sleeping, depending on whether we're a reader or a writer. Okay, and you'll see how this comes out in a moment. And here was our reader code. And what we're going to do, uh, there's uh, those of you that looked at the number of slides probably uh, took a quick in uh, in breath there, worried about how many there are. But these are, there's really a simulation in here that makes things uh, faster. Uh, not as slow as it seems with all those slides. So what a reader does is a reader first checks himself into the monitor, which means you always acquire the lock. And then we do a loop. And our condition we're checking is as long as there's either an active writer or a waiting writer, OK, any number. So we sum them together. It's greater than 0. We're going to go to sleep. OK, there's that priority for writers that was asked about earlier. And so basically, we're going to say, well, we, have, we can't run right now, so we're going to increase the number of waiting writers that's wr plus plus and we're going to go to sleep on the okay to read okay and we have to give it our lock as well so that we can release the lock under the covers and then when we wake up we're going to decrement the number of waiting readers because why well we're not waiting anymore we're running something okay we're not active we're not active in the database yet so we're not doing anything with ar but we will keep looping in this, uh, checking our conditions, going to sleep, waking up, checking our conditions, going to sleep, waking up, until AW plus WW is zero. Okay, and the reason we have to keep checking is because we have Mesa semantics, which means basically that uh, even if somebody signals us, we get put on the ready queue, then we got to require the lock, then we wake up. By the time we finally get to run and start emerging, and once we emerge from condition wait, it's quite possible that that, uh, Conditions have changed again to make it unfavorable for us to run. So we always have to check our entry conditions, right? But assuming the entry conditions succeed, then we're going to increment the number of active uh, readers and release the lock. Okay. And now we're going to perform the actual read-only access in the database. Okay. And then when we're done, we reacquire the lock because we're going to uh, alter the monitor. We decrement the number of active readers. Okay. And then we check if, well, if the number of active readers is zero and the number of waiting writers is greater than zero, then we're going to uh, go ahead and wake up a writer. Okay, and otherwise, we're going to release the lock. Now, if you look carefully, we know for a fact that there aren't any active writers to look at because we were an active reader, so they ought to be sleeping. Okay, um, and uh, we know for a fact that. Um, we know there aren't going to be any waiting readers either because there was a reader would get to go through. Now the question here about can we put uh, WR plus plus before and WR minus minus what uh, after the loop? Is that what you're asking? I think so. No, because waiting writer plus plus means there's somebody sleeping on the sleep queue. Okay, and so we only want to say waiting. Uh, uh, excuse me, waiting reader plus plus if we're actually going to sleep. So WR plus plus and WR minus minus, we're tracking the number of readers that are inside this sleep queue. So they can't, we can't go on the outside because that wouldn't help us there. OK. Now, uh, why are we releasing the lock there before we go into the database? Um, okay, why don't, why don't we, uh, yes, to, to allow more readers, exactly, okay? So we have to release here so that other readers can come through this entry point, okay? All right, now, what about the code for a writer? Well, we acquire the lock. We have a different entry condition. While the number of active writers or readers is greater than zero, we go to sleep, okay? And uh, if we succeed, then we uh, increment the number of active uh, writers and release the lock. OK. OK, so let's go back for a second. Why can't we cond broadcast here? OK. Somebody want to tell me why we don't broadcast to all the waiting writers? Okay, so we only want one writer running at a time. Okay, 
Now, uh, I'm going to show you later that we could broadcast, but for now, let's do what seems obvious. We don't want to broadcast because we only want to signal one at a time. Okay? So that's our reasoning for the moment. Okay? So here, similar, right, to what we said before, conditions a little different. Uh, active writer plus plus basically says, uh, we now are an active writer, release the lock, perform the database access and checking out now, we acquire the lock, decrement the number of active writers and say basically now that if uh, there was a waiting writer, then we signal it to wake up. Otherwise, if there's a waiting reader, we broadcast to them all, okay, and release, okay. Now, uh, Alexander's comment there is correct, which is why broadcasting will work. It, uh, it's not as efficient. We'll get to that in a second. Just hold that thought for, for uh, a few more slides here, okay? So um, once again, why do we broadcast instead of signal? Okay, because we can have multiple readers. All right, the question about why we can't uh, increment and decrement waiting writers uh, and uh, and waiting readers on the outside of the loop. Um, actually, that you know that would kind of technically work because we have the lock. Uh, I prefer this. I think it's a lot clearer because it shows what the conditions are. Um, and uh, if you you would never condition signal if uh, nobody's waiting. But let's keep the code this way now because I, I think this is a lot clearer. Okay, let's not confuse things too much. All right. So why do we give priority to writers? So notice we first check and see if there's any waiting writers before we decide to do something with waiting readers. Okay, good. So the, the real answer there is uh, that's what we've chosen. The second answer is, in general, there are far few writers than there are readers, so we just want to get them out of the way. The third answer is that writers typically update the database, and the readers are always going to want the most recent writers. Okay. Now, there was an interesting, hold on a second here. Um, let me just see. Now, the other question was, what happens if we signal and there's nobody waiting? Okay. Um, that won't happen here because we sort of check it before we do it. But in general, the key thing with a monitor is that when you signal, uh, if there's nobody waiting, nothing happens, okay? So that's important. Um, in fact, that's a, a crucial part of monitors. So when you signal and nobody's waiting, nothing, ha nothing happens, okay? And uh, we will, uh, we'll talk about that a little bit later. But the simple thing to imagine is if you've got a queue and you want to signal anybody who's waiting, you just signal it rather than having to do something too complicated. Okay, it makes things a little simpler, all right? Now, all right, here we go. We're gonna see how this code works. You ready? So we're gonna use an example. We're gonna have the following sequence of operators. We're gonna have a, uh, whoops, sorry. We're gonna have a read, uh, from th uh, read one from thread one, a read two from thread two, a write from thread three, and then a read from thread four. And initially, we're going to set um, all of the variables equal to zero. So A, R, W, R, A, W, W, W. OK, are you ready? There we go. So first of all, R1 comes along. And notice that we have nothing, uh, nobody in the system. So everything's zero. So first thing we do is acquire the lock. We enter the monitor. And then we say, is A, W plus W, W greater than zero? The answer is no. So now uh, all is well, we increment uh, the number of readers, AR plus plus, that gives us a one, and we release the lock. Now, I wanna point something out. Normally, you have to be very careful whenever you do plus plus on a shared variable. AR is a, and WR for that matter are great examples of variables shared across a, an arbitrary number of threads. Okay, so why can we say, WR plus plus or WR minus minus or AR plus plus without worrying about this because we have the lock exactly. So notice we are in a critical section. We acquired the lock and we're releasing it down here. Everything in the middle here you think of as a critical section. Okay. And so therefore we don't have to worry about the atomicity, anything else. Okay. And after we've released, uh, why release the lock there again? 
before we enter the database? Right, to allow more readers, exactly. Okay, so the condition variable and the monitor, monitor is actually being used to control access to the database so that it meets our constraints. So any, any thread that gets into this database, we've already checked its uh, access, okay? And once it's there, it's accessing properly and we're not violating the reader's writer's constraints, okay? Now, here comes the next reader. R2 comes along, acquires the lock. Notice it can acquire the lock because the lock is free, okay? So it's not a big deal. Now it's gonna check this condition. Is AW plus WW still equal uh, to zero it's, or not greater than zero? Yep, so we increment AR plus plus. Okay, now we have two, release the lock, and now we've got two readers simultaneously accessing the database. Okay, so far this is kind of boring. But now um, the database could be accessed for a long time. So these readers are busy doing something complicated. There are no locks that are held and only AR is uh, non-zero. So no locks are held and the only this integer variable AR is two and uh, nothing else is holding the system up. So we're good, okay? Now along comes the first writer. Now things get a little interesting. So once again, we grab the monitor lock, that's great. And now we say, is the number of active writers plus active readers greater than zero? Yep. Okay, so now we know there are readers in the database. And so therefore we increment WW, okay? Cause there's a waiting writer, we go to sleep and uh, that's it. So that guy is sleeping. Okay, and he's sleeping where? He's sleeping on this okay to write queue. Okay. Meanwhile, R3 comes along and notice that uh, the original two writers are still uh, running, okay? Now this is gonna be a little different than the two writers or two readers at the beginning, right? So we have grabbed the monitor lock. Oh, by the way, for those of you that are purist and wanna think under the covers, as soon as we do conditional wait, notice we've done that with the lock, right? We're still in the critical section, but when we do a conditional wait, we not only give it the conditional variable, we also give it the lock. So under the covers, the scheduler releases the lock at the same time it puts the thread to sleep. So the lock is free, but you as a writer of code should think of the lock as acquired for everywhere in between acquire and release. Okay, this is, I'm, I'm telling you to fool yourself because this is the way to think in this paradigm, okay? So that's why when the reader comes along, we can grab the lock because it's free. Okay, and now is AW plus WW greater than zero? Yes. Okay, so at that point, we're gonna increase the number of waiting readers and go to sleep. All right, why did we do that? Technically speaking, because there are uh, readers going on here, uh, we should be able to let the reader go through and start reading, but why don't we? Why do we choose to go to sleep? Okay. We want to let we want to let W1 go first exactly, okay? So because there is a waiting uh, writer, we're going to go to sleep as a waiting reader, okay? So now you see the writer is getting priority. So in fact, what's going to happen is AR uh, is going to go from two down to zero as those two original readers finish, and then we're going to get the let the writer go forward, and then finally we're going to let that reader come in, okay? Okay, R3 can't start because there is a waiting writer. So here's our status. R1 and R2 are still reading away. They're uh, checking out the whole database. W1 and R3 are, are sleeping. W1 is sleeping on okay to write and W3 uh, is sleeping on okay to read. All right, are there any questions on our current state of the system? We good? All right, gonna move on, move on. So now what happens? R2 finishes, r one still accessing. W1 and R3 are still waiting. R2 finishes, which means they exit the database and they acquire the monitor lock, which is free, right? They uh, decrement the number of active readers. Okay, so now we're down to one up there. And now they're gonna check the exit conditions. And if the number of active readers is zero, 
and the number of waiting writers is greater than zero, then we're going to signal somebody. Well, if you look, there's still an active reader in the database. So you could say that this guy exiting doesn't have to do anything, because he certainly isn't going to wake anybody up. Uh, so he's just going to exit, releasing the lock. And now we're done with him. Meanwhile, we wait maybe a long time. Who knows? And now R1 finishes, acquires the lock decrements the number of active readers. And so now we just hit a milestone. We just went back to zero on the number of active readers. At this point, is active readers zero and waiting writers greater than zero? Yes. At that point, we're going to signal on uh, the OK to write condition variable that uh, somebody can wake up. OK, so basically all the readers are done. We're going to signal writer W1. OK, and then we release the lock. OK, now. Let me go back here for a second. Um, I didn't actually simulate the release of lock, but because we have MESA scheduling, when we signal, all that we're doing at that point is just putting the uh, W1 on the ready queue. Okay, and so there's no nothing happens here when I signal to W1 other than it's taken off the sleep queue and put on the ready queue. Now, if this were poor scheduling instead of MESA scheduling, what would happen is this signal would cause the lock to, and the CPU to go immediately to W1, and then W1 would do some stuff. And when it released the lock, we would go back here to finish up. OK, so that has some really nice mathematical properties, as we kind of talked about last time. But it's really hard on things like system cache. And it's slow. And instead, what we did when we signal is we just take that waiting reader excuse me, waiting writer, put it on the, on the uh, ready queue, and then we're going to keep going. OK, and keep using our cache state until our quanta comes up. All right, so later, uh, when um, W1 receives a signal from R1 that wakes it up, uh, it was put on the ready queue, we said earlier. Um, it ran. There was an interesting thing in Piazza today, which I answered. So what actually happens here is uh, W1 is going to have been on the ready queue it wakes up, and under the implementation of conditional wait, what it's going to do as soon as it wakes up is it's going to try to reacquire the lock inside conditional wait. So it'll try to requ reacquire the lock. And if it turns out that the lock is taken because somebody else got in there before us, then it'll go to sleep again. But now this time, it'll go to sleep on the lock, not on the condition variable. OK. Now. Let me make sure I understand Brianna's question here. So signaling does not release any, any locks, OK? Um, if you look back here, when we did conditional signal, what it did was it just put that uh, writer on the ready queue. Then we released the lock here. So we actually decided to release the lock. But we could do it whatever else we wanted and not release the lock right away, OK? It's, it's uh, so how do we exit the while loop for uh, the reader and writer, OK? So the condition variable OK to read or write is changed. Um, can you explain uh, what you mean by how is it changed? OK, well, you're thinking about that question. I'm going to answer Carolyn's question here. How do we exit the while loops? Well, we exit the while loop here because something about these variables changed. OK, and so let's, let me answer that question with the re respect to the writer. So when we signal the writer, notice what we've done at this point. We've decremented AR down to 0, and we signal the writer. OK, and so now AR is 0. And so then we release the lock, and that signal put the writer on the ready queue. And up here, the writer was on the ready queue. OK, it, it woke up. It tried to reacquire the lock. Let's assume that worked. It grabbed the lock. And now it returns from conditional wait, at which point we decrement the number of waiting writers because there aren't any anymore. OK, well, no, excuse me. There's one less of them because we just woke up. We come back to the while loop. And now in answer to the question, uh, AW plus AR is now, well, what is AW plus AR? So AW is 0, AR is 0. When I add them together, they're no longer greater than 0. So that's what just changed. And so as a result, we're actually going to exit the while loop 
increment the number of active writers, release the lock, and now the database has uh, a writer in it. And notice that active writers is equal to one and waiting writers is equal to zero. Okay. Questions? Okay, and so the condition variables uh, merely let us wait. And when we wake up, we recheck our conditions and assuming that whoever signaled us changed the conditions that would have put us to sleep, then we'll exit the while loop. That's exactly what happened here, okay? So when we're waiting on the lock, but not the condition variable, that would be a situation where we executed condition wait, we went to sleep on the condition variable, somebody signaled us, we went on to the ready queue, we can't emerge from condition wait without the lock. Because remember, the way I'm telling you to think about this is you always have the lock in between acquire and release. This is a critical section. So the implementation of condition wait under the covers tries to reacquire the lock. And when it finally does, then it returns. And now I know when I uh, emerge from condition wait, I know I have the lock again. So a, okay to write is just a condition variable. So there could be many writers on there. Okay, condition signal, uh, how, does, how does this signal back here decide which one to wake up? It's undetermined. Okay, it's to think of it as a non-deterministic choice, randomly picks one. Okay, now, uh, in fact, that can matter sometimes. You may have to be careful not to uh, assume that somehow writers are going to be woken up in the same order they're put to sleep. If we ever have a piece of code where we want you to make that as an assumption, we'll make sure to tell you that assume that they come up in the same order that they went to sleep. But unless you're told that some, for some reason, assume it's non-deterministic. Okay. The question is, if okay to write's a Q, isn't there an inherent order? Well, there may be some combination of uh, put on the wait queue, put back to sleep, somebody else gets to run. Um, think of it as you're just not sure, only one of them wakes up. Okay. It may, there may be many different reasons why they don't wake up in order. Okay. All right, so here's a situation where the writer is in the database and if you notice, we have a waiting reader, so he's still sleeping. So we're writing away. Finally, we finish. We acquire the lock. Okay, we, ha we have the monitor. We decrement AW to zero. And now we say, are there any waiting writers? No. Is the number of waiting readers greater than zero? Yeah, look, there's a waiting reader. So what we do is we're going to broadcast everybody. So now here it's basically if... It uh, doesn't matter how many people are sleeping, we're going to wake them all up, okay? And then, of course, back here, we're going to release the lock and go forward. Here, potentially, suppose there are 20 of them. doesn't matter. They all wake up, but only one of them gets to run at a time. So even if there's 20 of them that were broadcast, it's the first one that grabs the lock again that emerges from condition wait. And it's going to say, oh, look, I'm going to set waiting readers to zero. It's going to check its condition. OK, it's going to see the while loop is no longer satisfied. It's going to set active reader plus plus. I sort of hurried this along a little bit. Sets active reader to one and accesses the database. If there were 20 of them, the moment that this first one released the lock, then the second one would succeed in grabbing the lock, emerge from condition wait, go through the while loop, exit and go to the database, et cetera. So if there were 20 of them on that queue and we broadcast to them, they would one at a time grab the lock, uh, decrement the waiting reader count, increment the active reader count and access the database. Okay. And then finally, we, uh, we're done. We acquire the lock. We decrement the number of active readers. We release the lock and we're all done. At that point, the database is idle and we have uh, made our uh, readers, writers, requirements. Any questions? So the thing to think about here is notice how clean this was, right? With the monitor paradigm, a lock and multiple, uh, a lock and multiple condition variables is very clean. 
Okay. Now this, when you say this middle section here, the access database is, I don't know that I would necessarily call this a critical section because we can have multiple readers in there at once, but it's the resource that we're doing some sophisticated control on where we're saying there can be multiple readers or one writer, but not both at the same time. Okay. So why again, the while loop in the here, you're asking why is there a while loop here? That's because we have Mesa scheduling. Because when we go to sleep, when somebody signals us and we wake up, it's quite possible that somebody else may have grabbed the lock before we did and changed the conditions. Like suppose we're the last reader and uh, we're about to wake up, but what happens instead is a writer comes along and beats us to the punch and increments the number of active writers, we're gonna to go to sleep again. So you always have to keep checking the condition in a loop. And when you can check the condition and you have the lock, then you don't go to sleep and you know that you have the condition. That's Mesa scheduling. All right, so questions here. Can the readers starve? Well, what do you think? Can, we, can the readers never get to run? Yep. Why? Well, because we always wake up, check our conditions again. If some writer keeps coming along, they may prevent us from going forward. Okay. Uh, what if we erase the condition check in the reader exit? So this is interesting, right? So if we say AR minus minus, and then we say, well, if AR is equal to zero and there is a waiting writer, suppose we don't look at that. Now what? Well, the potential here is we could end up signaling a writer even when there are still readers in the database or we could signal the writer when there are no writers, okay? So does this still work? Or did we just screw everything up? So the answer here is not quite we're Mesa, so we don't care, but it's the same idea. We always recheck our condition. So if we woke up a writer and there wasn't any reader, or, and there were still readers in the database, the writer would go immediately to sleep saying, oh, there's readers in the database. So even though we woke them up incorrectly, the entry conditions take care of making sure that we never violate our invariance. Yeah, it's kind of a self-checking thing. And it means that rel relative to the, uh, the non-MESA scheduled or the whore scheduled situation, this one you can be a lot lazier, okay, if you miss something. Now, of course, this is inefficient because we're gonna waste time with scheduling, but it sort of is uh, much more likely to be correct. And there may be situations where you can't get the exact uh, conditions for signaling. And as long as the, uh, the waiter checks its own conditions, then you should be good to go, okay? And even if we turn the signal into a broadcast, okay? That's okay, because even if we wake up a thousand writers, only one of them will get to go forward and the rest of them will go back to sleep. Now, the question is, uh, how much time do you spend checking in Mesa? Not, not a lot. Typically, you don't loop too many times, okay? Uh, and the benefit of Mesa is you get cash benefit. The schedulers are simpler. The code is much easier to verify. And so the advantages of Mesa scheduling far outweigh the disadvantages. You know, the, the, advantage, the disadvantage being you have to have a while loop and you might occasionally loop more than once, okay? And now the question is, suppose you know, we were keeping writers and readers separate, but suppose we only have one condition variable. You know, what then? Well, here's an example. So here's the reader and writer, and notice that um, I only have one thing called okay to continue. And so if my uh, reader entry condition's not good, I go to sleep on that. And if my writer entry condition's not go good, I go to sleep on that. And then when I'm done, um, the simple thing would be, well, I just, uh, I signal on okay to continue, okay? And this seems like it ought to work based on we just, what we just said, but if you're uh, carefully thinking through, you can see that this might not be quite right because R1 arrives, W2, R2 arrive, well, R1's still reading, um, and you get a situation where r one signal is delivered to R2 instead of W1, it doesn't quite work. Okay, and so in this situation, you're gonna to have to actually broadcast to, to wake people up. And that's really because we haven't distinguished readers to writers, and so we just gotta wake them all up and let them sort themselves out. Okay, so when we get lazy, 
sometimes we have to get really lazy, okay, to get correctness. Now, this is going to have some inefficiencies to it in that there might be a lot of things that wake up uh, and then have to go back to sleep. Okay. Um, so, as we know, um, so this wouldn't be as easy for, uh, well, this would actually have writers with priority because any writers that happen to be in the system would uh, wake up and run. If there was a couple of readers that got to go first, they might get to slip in there. So it wouldn't be strictly priority based. Um, and there's also a way uh, you should, this is for the you to think about offline, but you can also arrange so that things come in exactly the order they, they run such that readers and writers get to go in uh, phases. And so you don't have uh, readers uh, having lower priority than writers. You can actually arrange for something more sophisticated, but that's uh, for you guys to think about. So the exam is Thursday. It's getting close. Okay, video proctored. You've, got, you've seen that information. Okay, we want you to um, have a, your webcam and your um, phone. You gotta figure out how to position it. That's all on Piazza. And you need to talk to uh, the, the head TAs if there's some issue with that. Topics are basically everything up to today's lecture. If you notice, we really haven't done anything new today. We're going to talk a little bit more about implementation of threads in between. But these are things you already know something about from the labs. But um, scheduling is not part of the exam. So there's, no, um, there's nothing on uh, the lecture. Um, for, uh, there's nothing from uh, Wednesday's lecture. So um, part of the video proctoring is, uh, requires a camera on your face. So talk to, talk to the head TAs. Um, so homework and project work is fair game. Uh, the, so, uh, you know, you should know what you've been doing on your projects. Okay. So um, midterm review, uh, there is one tomorrow. There's uh, a Zoom link that's going to be mailed out. Um, and it, should, it may have gone out already. I know that it exists, and I know that the head TAs have it. So they may not have posted quite yet. OK. So any questions? So yeah, the, whole, the point of Zoom proctoring is the camera on, on you while you're working. So you need to figure out how to uh, arrange that. So um, that's a good question. Actually, uh, that's a very good question. Yes, you can have a cheat sheet, uh, both sides, OK, and written. Um, I, I guess we forgot to mention that to you guys. You're welcome to, to put together a cheat sheet. OK, but consider this otherwise uh, a closed book, OK? Um, we will give you any information that you need, OK? If you need man pages or, or other things, uh, we'll give those to you. You should be familiar with the simple calling sequences. Okay, and it'll be more uh, mostly pseudocode, although try to try to write as correct code as you can if we're asking you to write C. Okay. All right. Um, so today's lecture uh, potentially is uh, as I mentioned in scope, but that's because this is stuff that we already talked about last week. Okay. Um, you should probably know the signature, but we'll make sure that uh, we'll probably make sure you have complicated signatures. But things like open have a reasonably simple signature, and if you uh, transpose something, we won't give you a hard time about that. Okay. All right. Now, uh, the Zoom proctoring info is on Piazza. OK. Um, I think we've posted it. We'll make sure that we have, uh, we'll make sure that it's posted if we haven't. I thought it was up there. OK. So let's, uh, let's hold off on any, any further questions about the video proctoring. But um, we do want, this is part of making sure that uh, we have a nice clean exam um, and so everybody can feel comfortable that everybody else is behaving themselves so okay and uh, we're gonna the record the way the setup for the phones is going to be in the cloud I, I'm pretty sure that's the way we settled on it so you don't need a lot of local space for make this work <laughs>
So can we construct, so moving on to the topics here, can we construct monitors from semaphores? Well, it's pretty easy to make a lock with a semaphore. That's just the mutex uh, version. Can we implement condition variables this way? Uh, so there won't be anybody, uh, for those of you that are worried about the video proctoring, only the, only the TAs are going to be uh, looking at the cameras. It's not about everybody else. So um, can we implement the condition variable this way? Uh, wait basically says uh, for the semaphore that's the condition variable, we just do a semaphore P and signal does a semaphore V. Can every, anybody say uh, why they, this might or might not work? Okay, so semaphores have a cue, right? They can go to sleep, so that's not, you know, this, this has a cue associated with semaphore P. What else is an issue here? Yeah, so the big deal here, I'll assume this is what you meant, is that uh, you can't go to sleep with a lock, with a semaphore, right? If you have a, if you grab the lock, and then you call wait, you're going to deadlock your system because you'll put this to sleep and you'll hold the lock and everything will be broken. So this can't work for a condition variable, even though this seems like it ought to. Okay. So that will deadlock. Um, does this look any better? So this says, well, the way we do wait is we release the lock, we do a semaphore P, and then we reacquire the lock. And signal just does a semaphore V. What do you think? Okay, so the worry here that weight isn't atomic. Well, the problem is not actually atomicity here. The problem is history. So if you, rem if you think about it, if you do a bunch of signals and then do a weight, uh, in this implementation, the signals increment the semaphore, and so the next weights are going to go straight through. However, weight in a monitor immediately puts you to sleep, no matter what the history was. Okay, so a signal to an empty uh, condition variable does nothing. And this implementation doesn't do that trick, all right? So this is, uh, it may be subtle, but this would not give you, a give, give you a condition variable portion of a monitor, okay? Everybody with me? When you go, if, whenever you do wait with a monitor, it would, uh, you're always supposed to sleep. The problem with this is if you do a bunch of signals and then do a wait, the wait is not gonna wait, okay? So I would think of it, uh, if you have signals prior and then you wait, you don't go to sleep and that's actually not the monitor interface, okay? What if the, sig the thread signals and no one is waiting? Okay, that's a no op in a monitor but if a uh, thread and a thread later waits, the thread waits with a uh, thread V and nobody's waiting, you increment and later the P just decrements and continues. Okay, so anytime you go to sleep, well, I, I wouldn't worry about system calls now because we're, we're assuming that semaphores do whatever is required to put you to sleep, okay? And so probably inside the semaphore might be a few texts or whatever we talked at the beginning, but um, yes, anytime you go to sleep, that's a system call. But that's not really our issue here because we're assuming the semaphores have that figured out. All right. So uh, the problem with the previous try is that P and V are commutative, whereas signal and weight are not. Okay. And so that's an issue. Okay. And here might fix the problem. What we do is we say weight uh, does release, semaphore P acquire. And then uh, signal says, if the semaphore Q is not empty, uh, execute semaphore V. Is this okay? Good. This is not okay because semaphores technically don't let you check their cues, okay? So that's the issue, okay? And there's a race condition here and that the signaler can slip in after the lock release and before the waiter executes semaphore P. Turns out you can do this. And you can even do it for horse scheduling. There's one in uh, one of the books, uh, not, not your current one, 
um, but you could look that up. And it's a much simpler MESA scheduled solution, which you could also figure out. And as a hint, it has something to do with the fact that when you're holding a lock, you might actually have other variables, integers that could keep track of stuff. All right. So conclusion was, remember this. This is the MESA monitor pattern. Okay, the MESA monitor pattern is grab the lock, loop until conditions are right, unlock, do something, and then you exit by locking, maybe changing some condition variables, signaling and unlocking. Okay. Well, this one's a little subtle. So I will say, by the way, uh, synchronization is the hardest topic that we'll cover in this class. And um, especially the first time you see these synchronization conditions, it takes a little while to figure out what to look for. So this is uh, par for the course. You've, you've, uh, you've entered in to the, uh, the greater knowledge of synchronization here as a result of the last couple of lectures, but you know, it'll take a, wait, a little bit for it to settle in. Okay, all right. Now, I just wanted to quickly finish up because I want to move on to some other things here, but um, if you wanted to do semaphores in C, you got to be really careful because here's a situation where, or not semaphores, if you want to do synchronization support in C, here's a situation where if you acquire the lock and then you run into some error, you need to release the lock and return because otherwise, if you just return, then the lock is held and things might be broken. Um, there's something which you can look up, do a um, Google on set jump, long jump in C, which is even trickier because uh, this is the stack. And so we run A, runs B, it calls something called set jump, which really says that if we now call C, D, E, here E can call long jump and it'll basically pop back to, to B and it'll pop off all those chunks of the stack. That's, a, that's support in C. But if you have that, you can end up uh, jumping back to B and the lock is still held. So you got to be very careful with exceptions, okay, to make sure you can release the lock. Um, and this gets even worse if you have more than one lock going on. So if you have lock one and lock two, then you have to figure out how to release them all under errors. And so um, C is not great when you're dealing with uh, lock acquire and release, okay, but you got to be careful. Um, C++ uh, is both worse and better for this, okay? The one thing that's worse is this. If you notice this pattern here where I have a function, I acquire the lock, I call some other function, and then I release the lock, well, that other function uh, could get an exception. So C++ and Java and some of those others have exceptions. Well, the issue there is if you throw an exception, it's not necessarily going to return to do foo. It's actually going to jump out of the caller and you've left the lock uh, held, okay? So you might say, well, what I really do is I try, do foo, and I catch errors, and I do the release, okay? This is a pattern you might be familiar with. Better in C++ is guards. So this is a pretty cool idea. Here's a function where I, I grab a lock, but I do it as a special guard lock. And what happens is this gets, notice that this is in the local variable position. I know you don't necessarily know C++ a lot yet, but here's a local variable position. What that means is this lock variable was actually allocated on the stack on entry to this procedure. And any exit of that procedure, no matter what, will release the lock. And so you can have exits. Uh, normally, you can have exits because of exceptions, and the lock will always be properly released. So if you ever find yourself programming in C++ you want to make, and using locks, you want to make sure that you have something like this, a guardable lock so that it'll be automatically re released no matter what causes your procedure to exit. The other thing is Python has a with key keyword, which I'm sure you're familiar with, which is similar. Okay, and this is again with lock. If there's any reason that uh, this with gets exited, uh, this with block gets exited, then the lock will be released. And by the way, uh, with is good for all sorts of things, including opening files and having them automatically closed when you exit the block. Java. Uh, yep, Rust has uh, mutex guards. There's all sorts of stuff, okay? Most languages that are uh, more powerful um, and more modern than C certainly have nice clean ways of doing this. I did want to point out Java, which you're all familiar with for various reasons, actually has synchronized uh, keywords. So every object actually has its own lock inside of it. 
And so this class account, every time you allocate a new account object, then if you have a public synchronized uh, um, method, then when you run that method, what it does is it sets the, the lock on that object and runs a lock. And so back when we were talking about the, uh, the bank case, if you make things synchronized like deposit, then this balance plus equal amount, this automatically becomes a critical section that's protected by the lock that's inside the Java object. Okay, so that's kind of cool. And then Java also has support for monitors. And so in addition to that one lock, there's a single condition variable and you can use wait and notify or notify all or the equivalent of uh, signal and broadcast in Java. Okay, so monitors um, are well supported by modern languages as well. Okay, so last topic, um, we'll see how far we can get with this. I wanted to do a couple of things just because I've seen some queries on Piazza that suggested it, be, it might be helpful to have a couple uh, of quick discussions here. So if you remember, we were talking about multiple threading models. Um, this particular threading model is the standard one that you're dealing with with Python, for instance, or even uh, Linux. Every user thread has a kernel thread associated with it. Okay, And the way that happens is that uh, for every thread, the kernel maintains the thread's TCB, of course thread control block, but also um, a kernel stack for syscalls, interrupts, and traps. And sometimes this kernel state or the stack is called a kernel thread. Okay, so don't let that throw you for a loop. It's, it's state, and why do we call it a thread? Well, it's something that can be suspended and put to sleep inside the kernel. Okay, so the thread is suspended, but ready to go when the thread is running in user space. And as soon as the thread goes into the kernel, then the kernel thread takes over. Okay. And there are actually threads that are only in the kernel, so they still have a TCB, they still have the kernel stack, but not, they're not part of any process and they're busy doing things for the kernel, okay? And so those don't necessarily even have to run at user level. So Pintos, which you're now uh, familiar with, if you were to look at thread.c, what you'd see here, for instance, is that the, uh, the kernel portion of a, of a process or, or uh, is no, the process is basically this, uh, a four kilobyte page, where, which includes both the TCB at the bottom and the stack at the top, okay? And so what does that mean? That means that the kernel stack uh, is maximum 4K. In fact, it's a little bit less than that. That's however big the size of the uh, TCB is, okay? And um, so why is there a magic number here? Well, that magic number is some random bits that if your stack happens to overflow, it's likely to screw up the magic number and you might have some idea that there's a problem. But the key thing here is that uh, when you're in the kernel and you're running your Pintos kernel thread, uh, you better not be doing Fibonacci or anything super recursive because there's only a little bit of stack there, okay? And then also there is a page directory which points to a page table that's kept track of in the, the thread control block as well. Linux, similar, 8K, so it's two pages, okay? So two pages to hold your stack with a thread control block, and then something called a task sta uh, struct down at the bottom that um, basically is associating the uh, TCB with task state, which could optionally be part of a process. We're not gonna go into that in detail right now. Um, but normally what multi-threaded processes are, which is not Pintos, I'm sure you're all aware now that every process has exactly one thread in Pintos. Um, traditionally, multi-threaded processes have a process control block per process, and then each PCB has many TCBs. And so these are the TCBs, okay, thread control blocks, and every process control block has many of them if there are many threads, okay? Linux has one of these task structs per thread instead, and threads belonging to the same process share things like address space and so on. So Linux is a little bit um, less clear about is it a process or is it a thread in some other process. Uh, but for now, rather than worrying about this, this, uh, this idea that there is a single process control block that points at one or more threads is the way you ought to think about this. And in Pintos, it's easy because you can only have one thread per process. Okay. Now, uh, I'll leave that. So what does our kernel structure look like? Well, here's two threads. 
they each have their kernel thread, right? Which means it's a stack and a process control block piece uh, to describe the process, but the kernel thread is this kernel stack, okay? Um, and then the kernel also has code globals and heap for all the kernel code. Now there was an interesting discussion I saw on Piazza about, well, kernel, uh, if the kernel is holding a data structure like a pipe, where is it? Well, kernel has got lots of memory space. It's got a heap, okay? It's got globals. So the kernel has a bunch of data that's unique to the kernel that um, you know, it can store over time. So the stack is not the only place for data to be stored in the kernel, okay? There's also heap and globals. Now, if we go to a, uh, a process that has multiple threads, then what do we see? Well, I'm sorry about the uh, typos here with global wrapping around here, but there's basically uh, code global heap that's shared, um, and then each thread has its own stack, and it has uh, a kernel stack. So in this process number one with two threads in it, there are two kernel stacks to match the uh, two threads that are at user level in that process. Okay. and the code globals in heap for the kernel. Here is a full picture where we even have some kernel threads that don't have a user piece to them. Okay, so in that scenario, now we can have these kernel threads uh, doing things for the kernel. We have the kernel portion um, of, or the kernel threads associated with the processes. Everything that's got a kernel thread is now schedulable. So the scheduler in the kernel chooses between different uh, kernel stacks and therefore different threads. And so when we give CPU timeout, and that's gonna be next lecture, uh, I know you'll be studying, but you should definitely uh, make sure to come and hear about scheduling. Scheduling itself starts talking about how do we schedule across these kernel threads, okay? And of course, because we have to enter the kernel to do scheduling, then if we were running some thread in user space, we first transition into its kernel stack and then we do scheduling among those threads, okay? So, you know, we gave you this example. Remember the thread S goes to T and T goes back to S. And the reason I brought this up again is that scheduling, just like I showed you, we have threads have their own kernel piece, okay? And that kernel, thread portion of a user thread is the thing that gets switched when we go from scheduling one to another. Okay, and that actually was here as well. So here was an example I gave you. This is from a couple of lectures ago. Time is to the right, where we have a user thread that's running. It's got its uh, program counter or CSEIP instruction pointer and its stack pointer at user space. And then uh, when an interrupt happens or, or does a system call, the very first thing we do is we switch over to uh, the kernel stack and the kernel code. So notice that these registers are now in red and they're actually pointing at kernel code and kernel stack. And the remaining uh, and the um, ones from the user are saved on the kernel stack. So clearly if we wanna start this user thread over again in user space, we need to know where we were for this, the user stack and the kernel stack, excuse me, the. Uh, the user stack and the um, program counter. And so we save them on the kernel stack, okay? And we also might, and there's also a page table base pointer. We'll get into more of that later. And then we save out the extra registers. And now here in the middle, we're running on the kernel stack. We've saved everything we need for the user portion of that. And we're running away and we're doing a system call. Maybe we're doing uh, interrupt handling. Maybe we're doing scheduling. Okay, but notice that the registers, that's this box here, has uh, stack pointers and instruction pointers that are all pointing into kernel code. All of the user stuff is saved on the kernel stack so that when we wanna return, now we basically undo it, okay? So we first restore the registers that aren't the stack pointer and the um, instruction pointer, okay? And then on, when we do a return, it returns the, the uh, instruction pointer and the stack pointer and we're good to go. Now the question is, how does the interrupt know which kernel thread is associated? Well, the answer is that um, if you look at the uh, lecture where I first introduced this, the stack pointer for the kernel thread associated with the running thread is stored in the TSS structure. So at the moment you do an interrupt or a system call or any transition into the kernel, what happens on the x86 is it immediately grabs that new stack pointer 
and inserts it into the stack pointer uh, portion of the registers. Okay, so that's that's how that happens. And so when we change from one thread to another, which I'll show you on this next slide, um, then we have to swap out that register for TSS because we've got a new kernel thread. And if you notice here, by the way, that we started with thread A, we ended with thread A, we just ran in the kernel in the middle here. The alternative is, and you can look at switch.s, we start with uh, thread A, we go into scheduling, we restore thread B, and when we're done, it's now running the other thread. Another view of this is, in fact, here's the pin toss, for instance, one uh, thread per process. Okay, why do we need a TCB for every thread? Well, because the TCB has all the information about its stack, uh, its priority, it's got a list pointers that point it with the other threads. So there's a bunch of stuff about the TCB that's important for maintenance. Okay, and if you notice here, this is, uh, for example, uh, just a, a different view of what I just showed you here. Every kernel th or every, excuse me, user thread has its associated kernel thread, with the stack, uh, kernel stack on top of it. Okay, and the instruction pointer is called the PC. Um, here's another view of what we were just talking about. When we're running in user mode, the instruction pointer is pointing at code in user mode, stack pointer is pointing um, at the user's stack. Uh, and then this kernel stack points at the uh, kernel pointer in the kernel uh, thread associated with the running uh, user thread. Okay, and if you really wanna know what is KSP, well, this represents that special stack in the TSS, the, the uh, thread state uh, structure that uh, holds that kernel thread for us, okay? And here's an example where we're running in the kernel, uh, in a kernel thread which doesn't have a user portion. So notice we're running in kernel mode, the, uh, the uh, programming level is zero. Notice it was uh, three back here as user mode, okay? And here we are uh, in the, uh, you, here we are in kernel mode and notice we're running kernel code and we're running on a kernel stack. So the question about phi base uh, is manually, it's set basically as part of our uh, scheduling, okay? Um, if you notice, here's an example where we were running the user code, but now we've taken a, an exception or an interrupt or a system call. And now at this point, uh, we're on the kernel stack associated with the user thread. Okay. All right, oops, did I just crash here? Oops, sorry. So I wanted to say a little bit, although we're running a tiny bit low on time, if you guys give me a moment. Um, if you notice, when uh, Pintos hits an interrupt, what happens is um, the hardware says, oh, an interrupt is something, okay? That interrupt for a timer, for instance, might be OX20, okay? Because that's interrupt, you know, number 20 hex. What that means is it looks at a table and says, oh, this interrupt is 20 hex. Let's grab the, uh, the instructions to run. And it turns out in Pintos, what happens is we push the number 20 on the stack and we jump to an interrupt entry which runs a generic handler. But at that point, notice we know which interrupt it was. It was 20 hex. Okay, this is an interrupt vector table, yes. Okay, and so this is basically how the kernel ties in all the interrupts to the code that should run. So in stubs.s, there's a generic handler. If you take a look at your code, what happens there is we enter uh, the interrupt. We save the registers, okay? So this is a situation where we go to user, to kernel via the interrupt vector, that's gonna take us to this situation here where uh, we are gonna go into the interrupt vector table, it's gonna tell us where to start running, and when we enter the kernel, we're gonna transfer so that we're gonna start running on code associated with the interrupt, okay? So the various numbers, you take a look at that table correspond to different, uh, different interrupts, okay? Some of them are system calls, some of them are interrupts, okay? So here's a situation where now we just uh, switched to the kernel thread for the process, and we might have been pointing at code that was associated with the interrupt handler in that instance, okay? But we're running on the stack associated with the kernel thread associated with the user thread that was running, okay? And so here, we now call the actual interrupt.c to handle the handler for inter timer interrupt, okay? And Pintos has a second table, which is a mirror of the first one, Okay, but that table is for Pintos handlers to handle the timer interrupt, for instance. Okay, and if you look in timer.c, you'll see that. 
So that timer interrupt is Pintos's version of what to do with timers, and it's going to deal with ticks. Okay. And uh, the tick updates a bunch of counters for threads. And if it says, well, this thread's gone too long, then it's going to set a yield flag. And we know at that point that we're going to yield the current thread and do something else. Okay. Thread yield basically is on the path to return from the interrupt. It's going to set the current thread back on the ready queue. Um, and then schedule to schedule the next thread, which is next lecture, which selects the thread to run and then um, starts running it. Okay, it's going to call switch threads, which is switch. Remember, we talked about that earlier. It's going to set the status to running. Um, if it's a user thread, it's going to activate the process and so on. And then it's going to return back to the interrupt handler. I'm just giving you this very quickly so you can see this once. Okay, so here's a situation where we were running this guy. And um, the, time, the scheduler decided the second guy is going to run. And so switch switched us from the kernel thread on the right to the kernel thread on the left. So that now when we go to return, we're going to return to user mode. OK. So um, each uh, thread is going to have its own unique thread ID. OK. And the kernel thread is uh, associated very tightly with the thread that's running because this is the thread control block. For that thread. Okay. Now, so notice that we uh, called timer interrupt. We did tick. Uh, we decided we needed to yield. We decided we needed to switch. So when we switch threads, like this. Now notice what happens if we return from interrupt. We're going to return voila to a new thread. Okay, that's exactly how scheduling happens. Okay, so we just undo all of this. And we return, and suddenly we're running the old, the new thread, excuse me, instead of the old one, and the old one is on a ready queue somewhere. So this is the magic, right? The magic is interrupts, uh, timer interrupts happen. They decide whether it's time to schedule. They pick a new guy to schedule. They take the current kernel thread, put it to sleep. They load the new kernel thread, and then when they return from the kernel, they're now running the new thread, and we've just scheduled thread B instead of thread A. This is my favorite quote. I have to make sure everybody sees this. Dennis Ritchie, one of the uh, designers of C and uh, the original, uh, one of the original Unices, uh, basically put this comment into the code in the core that runs switch. It says, if the new process paused because it was swapped out, set the stack level the last call to save you. This means that the return, which is executed immediately after the call to a ret you, actually returns from the last routine, which did the save you. So he's talking about switch. Look what it says. You are not expected to understand this. That's my favorite comment in any piece of code ever. OK. Um, now, uh, the question here is the time between timer interrupts decided by the hardware, yes. OK, but only because the operating system has programmed it that way. So the timer is programmable. But once it's been programmed, then it goes off on a regular basis because of the hardware. OK. Now, if you remember what scheduling is about, scheduling is about deciding who's next. And I'm not going to go into this now, but I want you to know next time we dive into that decision making, how do we decide which is the next thing to run? Okay. The other thing I wanted to briefly say something about here, if you give me just a few, a couple more minutes here, I'm almost done. Um, if you remember, every process has, goes through a translation to take virtual addresses to physical addresses. And that translation goes through a page table. And that lets us uh, basically make sure that every process has a protected space to run in. And, every, and the kernel has a protected space to run in. OK? And so the address space basically is uh, the primary mechanism for handling that translation. And don't worry, we're going to go into address translation in great detail in a couple of weeks. But if you remember, the basic idea was this one of mapping. So the code for program one. Uh, is mapped to a code segment, and data is mapped to a data segment, et cetera, et cetera, which is independent from program two. And program two basically looks just like this uh, particular view of memory that we've been dealing with. And what we're saying is that this address space that you're used to gets mapped through the translation to specific places. And what does that really mean when we're talking about kernel space? Well, what it means is the virtual space that a process sees in Pintos, for instance, has kernel space at the top, okay, and user space at the bottom. So all the things the user is using 
are in this bottom spot, which uh, has page table entries that point to physical memory. The kernel space, while it's mapped, isn't available to the user, okay? So there are a bunch of page table entries that are in the virtual address space, but if the user code tried to use them, they would fault, okay? And it would get a page fault. And why do we do it that way? Well, if you look at the page table entry, by the way, this is gonna be described in great detail in a little while, uh, a couple of weeks. Uh, the user supervisor bit basically says, is a page table entry for the user or not? If the page table entry is only for the kernel and we're in user mode, then you get a page fault. And you can look at page dir.c, by the way, to see this. So what does that mean? That means that if we take an interrupt, notice how my uh, programming level went to zero, then all of a sudden the parts of the kernel space that were unavailable are now available and these page table entries are ready. So now we can have the kernel fully protected, but all of that space is now available for heap, you know, there was questions in Piazza, where are, the, uh, where are the pipes stored? Well, they're stored in kernel space. How are they protected? Well, they're protected because the user is not allowed to access them. Okay. And of course, the base tab uh, page table uh, base register points at a particular place in memory where this page table is. And so when we switch from one process to another, we just switch the base table. Okay. All right. And so for instance, one kernel, many stacks, kind of looks like this, okay, that's the many threads, and those stacks are only accessible when we're in kernel mode, otherwise the users can't touch them, okay? All right, questions? Okay, I think we've, we've run out of time. I was going to, uh, Look at a little bit more, um, a little bit more detail about the storage levels and kind of how um, things like pipes and stuff worked. We'll save that for another. Uh, we'll save that for next lecture. This will not be uh, on scope for the exam. All right. So what I want to say here, to, in conclusion, we've been we talked a lot about monitors. Um, I will hope uh, that everybody kind of has a good idea now how the monitor works. So the monitor is a programming paradigm. It's a lock plus one or more condition variables. You always acquire the lock before accessing any shared data. And then in the critical section of that lock, you check parameters and potentially go to sleep. Okay, and so you always go to sleep, but only when you hold the lock. Okay, monitors are the logic of the program. You wait if necessary, you signal when there's a change so that waiting threads wake up. And monitors are supported natively in a bunch of languages, we showed you that. We went over in great detail in the reader's writers example. Um, we talked about kernel threads, which are stack plus state for independent execution in the kernel. Every user thread paired one-to-one -one with the kernel thread in a typical Pintos, certainly, and also in typical Linux, uh, which is not running threads at user level. Okay, and the kernel thread is the thing that lets you go to sleep. So the good thing about every thread having a kernel thread is you can put it to sleep if uh, you try to do I.O. and none of the other threads are affected. Okay, next time we'll talk about device drivers. All right, and so the page table base register, one last question on the chat here, is switched uh, from uh, one to another when you change the PCB, not the TCB. So when you change which process you're in, then you gotta change the page table base register. If you're going from one thread to another, you don't have to change it. And actually just, I had a little bit of a, a seek, well, anyway. I, I could show you that later, but if you were to go back and take a look at the the slides where we were talking about um, where we were talking about switching from one thread to another, what you would see there is uh, that I basically uh, changed the page table base register to page table base register prime. So, all right, um, I think we are good. So I want to bid everybody uh, adieu. I hope you have a good night, and uh, we will see you on Wednesday, I hope, and good luck studying. All right, have a good night, everybody.